Father's Day today. All right, so let's go. Um, so, hello, my name is Teresa Schechter. I am the director of the film, My So-Called Selfish Life. Um, I am going to start us off with a few questions for you to ponder. Feel free to drop the answers in the chat if you'd like. How big is family size? What does starting a family mean? And what the hell are family values? One dictionary definition of family uh, is parents and their children living together as a unit, which is also known as a nuclear family. So I grew up in what can be described as a pretty classic nuclear family, mother, father, sister, and me. And we are repeatedly told that this is the ideal family unit. Um, it was actually really good for me, um, but was it good for me because it was a nuclear family or was it just that the people in my family were and are pretty wonderful, stable, loving, supportive, is it the nuclear family or is it just that I had the very good fortune of being born into a family of wonderful people? Uh, because for a lot of other people, that classic nuclear family is not so great. Um, there are so many ways that relationships within families can be fraught, they can be toxic, and they can even be very dangerous. So just because a family has two parents and a couple of kids, it, it doesn't mean it's working. And as I say in the film, the nuclear family does not have a monopoly on love or support or legitimacy. So when we talk about how we really live our lives, um, the definition of family really has to be broader. Or maybe we just need to throw all the definitions out the window and let go of the idea of what is you know, normal. For those of us who don't want children, what do our families look like? Maybe we live with a partner or a chosen family of trusted friends, or maybe it's you and your grumpy cat who secretly does love you. So let's talk about creating the families that we want and the families that we need and the families as we want to define them. There is a lot to talk about and we have the perfect panel to do that with, uh, three of the stars of my so-called selfish life. Hello. I'd love to introduce them. Um, Marsha Dred Davis <laughs> has been on the child-free path for over 48 years. Even after losing her job as a teacher from an interview on 60 Minutes, resulting in death threats and picketing whenever she spoke. At 79, she is still a passionate supporter of the child-free lifestyle. She also hosts cruises, I'm gonna be on the next one, where groups of child-free people get a chance to hear speakers and meet other child-free people for an entire week. And she's the author of two books, Confessions of a Child-Free Woman and What? You Don't Want Children? Uh, both available on Amazon. Uh, Michelle Gatto, Hey, Michelle, is child-free by chance and by choice. After deciding she was just fine without kids, she went back to school at 42 to figure out why society was so concerned about her uterus. Uh, she has a master's degree in public health and bioethics with a focus on reproductive health and ethics. And she has just finished her first year of a sociology doctoral program where she is focusing on bodily autonomy. She lives in Cleveland, Ohio with her husband and her cats, who may make an appearance if we're lucky. <laughs> um, Dr. Shanna katz Katari, hello, um, is an assistant professor of social work and a women's and gender study, sorry, assistant professor of social work and women's and gender studies at the University of Michigan. And she is the author of the award-winning book, social work and healthcare practice with transgender and non-binary individuals and communities. And she is a sexuality educator offering open source sex education for adults and teens. In their free time, they are a parent to four cats and a sassy pit bull, this is new, enjoy cooking, murder mysteries, and D&D. So uh, welcome to all of you. Really glad to have you here. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna start with a, a softball question. 
not really. Um, and any one of you can jump in on this. Um, if you're quiet for a long time, I'll just pick somebody. Um, so why are nuclear families supposed to be the best families? Well, I mean, I think from the beginning of time, it was considered to be the most important part of your life. Throw in a little bit about religion, a little bit about social indoctrination to what should be a part of your life and that a uterus is, is not worthy unless it's filled and we have it right up to today with what's expected, especially for women and men and both. Anybody else would, wanna weigh in? Yeah, I would say white supremacy, cishet patriarchy, ableism, colonialism, right? Like, you know, um, you say from the beginning of time, but from beginning of like white Christian time, right? Because so many cultures don't have that style of family, right? So many cultures have this, it takes a village mentality or, you know, these are the people that raise the kids. These are the people that do the farming. These are the people that do the hunting. So, right, it really is this indoctrination, as you said, but with the, these very specific capitalism, right? If everybody needs their own home, we sell more houses. Uh, yeah, it's just lots and lots of oppressive values coming to play. Yeah, I think to Shana's point, it's not, um, it's really more of a recent invention in a lot of ways, right? Like if we look historically thousands of years ago, people didn't live just to themselves. They had big extended groups of people who were um, doing specific things. It was, they were really much more villages where some people took care of the children, some people did certain jobs, hunting, gathering, whatever. It wasn't a nuclear family in you know, certain tribal communities still today. It's some people, you know, they have children, but then other people take care of them more frequently than the own, like even the birth mothers do. It's not, it, it's not the way we conceive of it in the Western. It's a very Eurocentric Western con construct. Um, and I, we've really decided, so we, as like the Eurocentric we, have decided that people who present as female women with uteruses are supposed to be caregivers to everybody. Um, and we don't really value that care in a way. It's supposed to be free labor. Sorry, here's a cat. <laughs> yeah, we like, we like the cats. I think that's good. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. So uh, it, it is true that this is a very much a um, product of our white heteronormative um, capitalistic culture. And, but I, I do think that for most people, if you ask them what a family looks like, they're going to say, well, it's mother and father and some kids because it's ingrained that this is, this is normal. There are a lot of things I think we think of as normal that aren't really that normal if you think about it but um like a lot of things i don't i don't think a lot of people you know think too much about it so which is why we're talking about it now so i want to learn more about your own families your families growing up uh your families um currently so i'm going to start i'm just going to go around the group and i'm going to ask each of you to describe your family when you were growing up and what you thought your family would look like when you were older. So when you were, you know, 12, what did you picture when you thought about your family when you were a grown up? So um, let's start with Shanna. Yeah, so I'm uh, born and bred Coloradan. Um, and I, I was born into a family of a geriatric pregnancy, if you will. My mom was 38 when she had me uh, and then 42 when she had my sister. Um, so lived with my mother, father, sister, very similar to you, Teresa. Um, and until I was 13 and my father passed away. And so, you know, then even this idea of, um, I remember as, as a 13 year old, I was like, is my mom going to date someone out? Like, am I going to get a stepdad? Like what, because there is this assumption, right. That like, you have to replace what's missing. Um, and she didn't, she still hasn't, uh, they were married, I think for 29 years when he died and she had no interest in, 
you know, replacing him in, in any way or form. And so our family then became the three of us. Uh, my sister and mom are very close. I was not super close. And so at 16, I left to go to college and uh, was kind of out of there. Um, so for me, that's my family of origin uh, has always been much smaller uh, than most folks. One of my partners is Italian Catholic and tons of folks over there. The other one is Midwestern and tons of family. But I had, you know, my my grandfather and my aunt on one side and my my grandmother and my uncle on the other side and everybody else lives in Israel. So we're very, you know, even, even the extended family was smaller. Um, I never really had a lot of intention around having kids. I remember um, having like a conversation with my mom, maybe when I was like 10 or 11. And I was like, you had kids too late because now I'm going to have to have kids at like 20 for you to be a grandma. And then my kids are going to have to have kids at 20 for, you know, you to be alive if they ever want to know their great grandmother. And so I had this whole like very clear, right? My autistic brain, like laid out process where I was like, if we want to do this, the way we're supposed to do this, like we are behind and I need to but it was never about me having children. It was about potential children having grandparents that were alive. Um, and I always remembered I'd find names. Uh, and this was even through college of like names I'd love. Cause I'd be like, oh, I'd read a book and I'd be like, Trisana, that's such a great name for a kid. And then yeah, Tamara, Tamara Pierce, if anybody, you know, is a fan of that. Right. And then I would name my fish that. And then I would be like, oh, Niamara, what a great name. Like this would be the name I would give my child. And then I would name my hamster that, right? And so like, I like would come up with these names because all my friends were like, well, of course I'm gonna name Christine after my mom and this after this. And I was like, well, I have the names but I, I never thought about children. So I would just give them to my pets so that I could have folks with the names. But then I was like, oh, I guess I'm out of names. No kids for me. So, so the reason that you have no kids, Shanna, is you have exhausted your supply of names. Well, but now I just, and now I just pass them on to the animals. Um, I've, I figure, I mean, that's clearly the only reason uh, I have not born a child. Okay. Thanks very much. Marsha, what did your family look like when you were young? And what did you think your family was going to look like? Well, that's interesting. I mean, I grew up in the typical Jewish kind of ghetto of the amalgamated housing project in the Bronx. We all lived together. The extended nuclear, I mean, the nuclear family was there. My grandparents lived below in the second floor and I lived on the fourth floor. So my cousin lived there, my grandma, my grandpa, um, and then my aunts and uncles all lived in the same community. Um, as far as what did I think in the future, I'll never forget when my mother first told me where babies come from and how they come out. I said, what? I don't care how big that vagina stretches. I don't want to have that happening to me. And my mother looked at me and said, oh, but it's worth it. It's so worth it. And then she told me that she labored with me for three days. And I thought, I don't know. I don't know what, maybe I was worth it. I don't know. I'm not sure about this. So I don't think I ever actually saw myself as having a family of my own. And I didn't have to worry too much because I was divorced early to the first one. And then the second one, that's when it really came out because I was older and I got all the pressure. And that's when I went into therapy to see what's wrong with me because why didn't I want to have a family? Um, the one thing that's interesting is that my mom and dad divorced when I was 13 and my, my little sister came into my life when I was 15. That was an eye opener because I saw reality. I mean, I saw reality day in and day out what my, my mother had to deal with and my stepfather um, and we had, a, we had a nanny who came in every day, but the reality of what she went through, not just with my little sister, Robin, but with me as a teenager, and, and I don't know how she did it, to be honest. I really don't. So did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Something about um, seeing uh, very young children firsthand and having to take care of them possibly. When you're older, when yeah. you're older, it's, yeah. it's eye opening. Um, Michelle, how about you? Um, you know, much like you and Shanna, I had a very, you know, I, I normal, like a very typical, normal family. Um, you know, my, my parents are still married. They have been married for, it'll be 51 years this year. Um, I have a younger brother, um, you know, quiet rural America upbringing, uh, small town America. Um, and you know, I, 
it was great because my family's great. Um, I was very close to my brother growing up. My, I'm still very close to my parents. I, you know, talked to them both this morning. Um, you know, they're in their seventies now. They're both lovely people. Drive me crazy, but they're both lovely. Um, and I thought I would have children. Like I really imagined that I would, that it, it, that I would be married and have children um, like Shanna, I used to pick name. My favorite names came from books. <laughs> so there was a period of time where I was, um, the, so the Anne Rice, not the vampire books, but she had, um, the Mayfair witch books. I, there was, um, some names out of that, that I was like collecting as names for the eventual six children that I thought that I would have. Um, I calmed down after that. And then I was like, oh, maybe I'll have like, you know, two or three children. Um, you know, my brother has four children. Um, but my brother is an evangelical Christian now, um, and we don't speak. We haven't spoken in five years. That's a whole thing. Um, but yeah, I just, I thought I would have kids and then I couldn't. And so I don't. Um, and that is also fine. It's been fine. Um, actually it's been wonderful. Like I love my life. I, my life would not be what it is now. If I had kids, I'm sure it would be equally wonderful. Um, and that I would be a great mom, but I'm happy not to be, and that's also okay. So yeah, I, you know, I think, I think we, uh, place a lot of value on something that isn't necessary to people's lives. So, and my parents are totally, by the way, my parents are totally fine that I don't have children. They would have been happy if we'd had kids, but they're also totally happy that I don't have kids because in a lot of ways it's allowed me the fact that Steve and I don't have children has allowed me to do things for them in their old age that I would not have been able to do had we had children. Excuse me, did you say seven days old? <laughs> <laughs> it's not old, but you know, they're retired. And because they, they spent a lot of, they, they didn't save for retirement because they paid, they helped pay for us to go to college. Um, and they were all, we were always low income. Like they, my parents never had any money, really. They were always poor. Um, so last year for my parents' 50th anniversary, my husband and I bought them a house to retire into, to downsize into, um, cause they couldn't afford it. If we had kids, I couldn't have done, we couldn't have done that. Right. So like there are things that it, not having children has allowed us to do that we wouldn't have been able to do if we had them. Right. So Michelle, I'm just going to stick with you a little bit because, um, you know, your story in the film is one of, you know, assuming you were always going to have a family, um, spending many, many years trying to get pregnant, uh, finding out that that was not going to be physically possible, and then figuring out what your life would look like after yeah. that. Um, and I'm just wondering, I know you're in a really great place now and really happy where, where you are, but, um, I think the Mother's Day is very difficult for some people who who really want children and can't have them. And uh, it's this is a tough day. And I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit of um, how, how it felt when you decided I'm, I'm, I'm done, you know, mm -hmm. um, this is yeah. going to happen, I'm done. So I will say that um, Mother's Day is still my least favorite day of the year. I hate it. Um, and, but I don't hate it because I'm not a mom. I hate it because everyone assumes that I am. And I think that is probably true for everybody in the film who is uh, female in appearance to the outside world and doesn't have children. So anyone who is, looks at, like a woman over the age of 25 and doesn't have a child, if you go, anywhere out of your front door on Mother's Day. Right. Everyone is like, happy Mother's Day. He, you know, so we don't go to rest. Like, I don't leave my house on this day of the year ever. I don't because I hate it. And, and again, it's not because I feel like I've missed out on something. I don't. It's because I don't need to be assaulted with your assumptions about me and my body. Stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. Um, yeah, so, and it, I think it's also that, um, you know, I just, when we made the decision, when I made the decision to stop trying and being okay with it, 
I really have never looked back. It's been 11 years since we made the decision. And I like, it opened up a whole um, avenue of pursuit for me in my life that I, I am someone now I never imagined I could be. That's been amazing. And, you know, it doesn't mean that I don't like children or that I don't want to be around them. I have friends who have kids. And, you know, the best thing about it is I get to, I'm, you know, I went back to school seven years ago. I'm around so many incredible young people all the time in their early twenties. It it is the best. I love it. Like these young kids are, I mean, they're not kids, they're like young adults, but they're so, Shanna, because she's a professor. It's incredible. And I wouldn't have that. It's, it brings me so much joy every single day to be around these young people. And I just absolutely love it. And I wouldn't have that. It's such a gift to me. So. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. And that, is that Bear or Birdie? This is Birdie. Birdie. Okay, great. Hi, Birdie. Um, uh, Shanna, um, talk to us a little bit about how, um, what your family looks like today. And I know that in the film, we talked about how uh, when you and Leo looked like a heterosexual couple, looked like a heterosexual couple, that's when the pressure started. So tell, give us a little bit of that story and how things are today. Yeah, so um, I am polyamorous. I have two uh, long-term partners. So one is the um, delightful transmasculine um person in the film leo who he and i have been together we, i we actually realized the other day that he has been in my life longer than my father was uh at this point so he and i have been together a little over 13 years uh almost four it'll be 14 years in december um we met in colorado he was finishing up his msw program we moved to arizona back to colorado i did my phd we live here now um, and then we moved here, being Michigan, almost five years ago, and I met my other partner, Allie, about three years ago. So we had about a year of a relationship until the pandemic started, and um, Leo, during the pandemic, moved out and bought his own house, and Allie moved in with me. Um, we live about 10 minutes from each other, so the three of us, um, are con we consider ourselves a little polycule, um, and then Leo has another partner as well. And between the, the two houses, we have four cats, uh, three at this house and one at Leo's house and uh, a dog, Marla Pooch, Marla the Pooch, if any of you like um, a league of their own, Leo's a big fan. So my partner, Allie, who's also non-binary, uh, brought uh, their cat, Sir Catrick Stewart. So we have Sir Catrick Stewart, Vladimir Houdini and uh, Artemis Time live with us. And then Kinsey, who is my um, cat I've had since college and is, is nearing the end of his life, uh, lives with Leo and Marla. Um, and yeah, the uh, none of us want kids. None of us have ever had an interest in having kids. Uh, Leo and I talked um, and we still, as a, as a unit, talk about uh, fostering um, queer and trans teens who need uh, space and support, uh, particularly those who have been kicked out of their homes. Um, so that's, that's always on the radar, although also as a disabled person, um, I think about the impact that navigating children full-time would have on me, um, whether, you know, like even with the dog, I was like, we can't have a dog here because if I can't pick up an animal to carry it to safety, right, like it makes me nervous. So I think about with kids, the impact on my body um, would have. So we, you know, we are a unit. We, but when you say family, that's, that is my family of um, really, like sexual and romantic relationships, but our family is a chosen family. And so um, my best friend and her kids out here are part of my family. My best friend in Cleveland, I point to Michelle um, and her kid and partner are part of our family. Um, and then, you know, other, other folks, uh, basically like all the, the baby queer and trans folks at the school become part of my family. So um, to me, and I think this goes a little bit into the, the question that Jim posted in the, the Q&A is like, do you define family as blood family or self-defined chosen family? Um, and as a queer and trans person, to me, chosen family has always been much more important um, 
and it's it's actually something that uh, enters my research because there's not a lot of research on how chosen family can be just as supportive and affirming, uh, if not more so. Um, so I'm going to drop a link to an article uh, that my doc student led with us, uh, but it's open access so everybody can read it in the chat, but it's about uh, queer and trans young people and how they use chosen family uh, to navigate health and healthcare spaces um, rather than just family of origin. Thank you very much, Shanna. Um, I'm going to go over to, oh, I should say um, any resources that are shared in the chat. And, and uh, um, folks who are here attending this, please feel free to put your own resources and thoughts and um, advice into the chat. We would really love to hear from you as well. And we're going to share all the resources in a follow-up email tomorrow. So don't worry about uh, copying things down as they go through the chat. We'll, we'll be sharing it all with you. Marsha. I want to, to share who my family is now. Being almost 80, I've lost a lot of the beloved people that have been in my nuclear family. And they have been a loss because they meant a lot to me. But right now I do have my sister and I have so many of what I call my sister friends. Although my beloved friend Jane said, I'm not in your family, I'm just your sister friend. I'm, it's not the same. Well, yes, it is, Jane, you're in my family. Take that and own it. <laughs> I love you as much as any real sister. But she has a point because no, she wasn't born into my family. I chose her and she was with me in another documentary that we shared. Um, my family is so extended right now that I have a list here that would go over the moon if I started to share it with you. And I really feel that they're a part of my life. One young guy, a young guy, he's now a grandfather and a great grandfather, goes back to 1965. Denard, I love you. This kid drove me crazy and I found him recently on Facebook and we reconnected and we are so together and forever we will be connected. I have a, a, a young girl going back to 1970, Sue, who has been with me all through her life, all through her ups and downs with her children and her grandchildren and her great grandchildren. Um, my husband walked down the aisle, one of our most beloved, I call her a daughter friend, when her family couldn't at that time. And for my husband, who never walked down the aisle, his own two children, it was the most gratifying moment of his life to be so welcomed and so needed at a time that she needed him. Uh, we love her. We love her son who calls me Marma. That's Marsha Grandma. And calls Jim Pappy and comes to the phone and goes, Marma! You know, now, they're not in my nuclear family, but they're a part of my life forever. I have Johanna who lives nearby, who during the uh, COVID scare went shopping for me because she lives nearby and would not let us go to the supermarket to get anything. She brought us our food every day. Her mother kind of said bye-bye to her at a young age. I found her at a meetup and it was instant love and we've been connected ever since. I mean, Jalen and Annie and Constance who calls Jim, Jimmy, Uncle Jimmy our neighbors, my CF followers, my cruise people who once they cruise with me, many of them are with me forever and I consider them extended family. So to me, I am so blessed with so many people. Certainly my best friend, Jane, my best friend, Linda, I have two Lindas, um, my friend, Marsha. They're so much a part of my life because they respect me. I respect them. They are there for me. I'm there for them. And it's forever. It's forever. So I hope that helps so many of you. Yeah, I say, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, I will say, I think that one of the things about not having kids is that it gives you more time to invest more deeply in relationships with other people that you wouldn't normally have. Because rightly, when you have children, you're put, especially when they're really little, you're putting all your focus on them because they need it because they can't care for themselves. Right. When you don't have that, right. you have the time to develop deeper relationships with other people. Um, and I think that that is in itself a gift. And I think, you know, I, some of my friends have friends who have children that they're very close to like they themselves don't have kids, but they have friends who have kids or they have siblings or whatever. And one of the joys that they have is being able to be present, to be a really supportive 
sister-in-law, aunt, whatever, because they don't have kids. And that in itself is a great joy to have that time and that freedom. And I think that's part of, you know, what we don't consider, like we don't consider that a nuclear family, but we, we need that also. We need people who don't have children to be able to provide that care relief or that support. Because being a parent is hard. You know, I mean, like raising children is freaking hard, especially today in this society. I have never been more grateful to not be a mother than in the last three years. Like who wants to deal with that shit in a freaking pandemic? Not me. Too old. Sorry. No, thank you. Many, many parents also, they have screaming. Have you seen this on, on all over the internet where they have screaming parties? They, they get together and they go, ah, for what they've been through and the horror of a COVID and having to care for their children 24 seven. Yeah, it's real. By the way, I left out Mater. I love you. Oh my God. And my Dr. Bonnie, what doctor gives a person their cell phone? Their cell phone. My and dentist did the same thing. Here you go. I mean, that's family to me. Yes. I mean, give me a break. I'm so lucky to have her. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to chime in with Michelle. I mean, I think something that I appreciate is during the pandemic, right? Like I, I'm immunocompromised. I am still mostly isolating, right? So like pandemic is still happening. Wear a mask. Yeah. Cases are going up again. Um. But like at the beginning of the pandemic, I was like, what can I do? I can't help my kids, my, my friends with kids, right? I can't go provide childcare. I can't go do that. But I wound up making um, sex ed groups for all of them who are having to essentially like emergency homeschool their kids. I was like, my background is a sex educator. You know, I brought my, I have my, my vulva puppet here. I was like, let's go. <laughs> what, Teresa's like, I, I have a lot of things in this room. I had to take down the floggers that were in the background before we, uh, but yeah, like here's my little, so, you know, I went to my office at work. I brought home all my stuffed STIs and my vulva puppets and all my demo things. And I made a, a seven to 10 year old class and a 10 to 14 year old class and a 14 to 17 year old class. And we did them synchronously, but then I also made the links so people could share them and sit right. Like, so that was something that I could offer. That was like, I would not have had the capacity to do that if I had kids at home. But this was something I could do for my friends who are now suddenly navigating having kids at home that they didn't plan for, right? Like that wasn't part of our, you know, I had lots of friends that had kids the first year of the pandemic because they were already pregnant, right? And we didn't think about what, you know, because we didn't know what was coming. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that the energy not only to develop deeper relationships with our friends, but also deeper relationships with kids that are in our community right? Whether, whether we consider them family or we consider it community care, right? I can show up and read Herschel and the Hanukkah goblins every year to like handle, you know, screaming kids around, uh, you know, luck of parties. And then I can give them back and be like, cool, your kids have been read to, they have a good night. I don't have to navigate that. And it's, it's a joy, right? Your children continue to be a joy to me in a way that I don't think they would be if they were mine and I couldn't return them. Oh no, Jim, I, oh God, just do. Oh, We're good, oh. everything's good. I'm not. Okay. Jim, <laughs> could you help me? <laughs> um, Marsha, mute yourself while you work out the okay, I, issues. I, I, Thank you. <laughs> Thank um, you. I, it warms my heart to hear uh, all of you talking about how you're involved in other people's lives and other with other people's kids. I'm someone who's not actually. Um, I'm just not. And um, I just want to let people know that's also okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I do not get down on the floor and play with kids. I never babysat. I don't um, tell kids stories. I love the idea of doing sex ed classes with them, actually. I would be so into that if I was qualified. <laughs> but I think that would be really fun. Um, so Having said that, um, when I say that to people, they say, oh, you may not have kids and you may not you know, take care of kids, but you mother in other ways. I really don't like that phrase and I wanna check in with you all about it. To me, that phrase is basically saying the top of the pyramid is mothering and then we all find ways to fit into that. 
as opposed to the top of the pyramid is maybe how we interact or care for other people. And some of that is mothering and some of it is fathering and some of it is whatevering, parenting. Um, uh, what, what do y'all think about that? I got a beautiful Mother's Day card that said, happy nurturing day. I love the word nurturing. And don't forget, you're nurturing yourself. You know your own boundaries. You know that you're not the kind of place with children. It's fine. I mean, yeah, a lot of us are saying we have this child and this child and this friend, and blah, blah, but you don't have to have children in your life either. So I love the word nurturing. Emphasis on nurturing yourself first, that inner child in you who has a boundary and you're honoring that. Yeah, I like nurturing. Nurturing. I am sensory sensitive and I cannot stand screaming, crying, yelling, loud noises that I have no control over, right? So like when I say I show up for my friends and their kids, it's things like reading books or like yesterday, my friend was like, we just need to get out of the house. We had Dr. Fauci speaking at graduation. Her house is right by the stadium. And so lots of right wingers were driving past and she's like, I can't, I can't, right? So I was like, I have a backyard. Your kids can run around. And I basically put on a sun hat and sunblock and just sat and watched, right? I was like, I'm not running after your kids, but I can offer, right, a space that is that is away and different. But, you know, even, Teresa, and just hearing you be like, well, there's mothering and there's fathering. And then what is, like, these things are so hyper-gendered, yeah. right? Like, 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 even being here, um, you know, I've gotten misgendered several times already because of how I look. Right. And because I look like in society's space, what a mother is supposed to be. And I'm a fat person. Right. So I always look like I'm a little pregnant. There, there's so much placed on a, like you're not a mother, but you could be or you could be all these things. And I well, I think I am maybe maybe a caring and compassionate person. I don't know if the term nurturing has ever been applied to me. And so like when I say I show up for like the queer and trans kids, I mean, that is like. I will go with you to help you get your name changed, or I will, you know, work with you to get your pronouns fixed in Canvas so that when you post for class, like you're not getting misgendered every time. Um, and showing up for my friends looks like, oh shit, my kid is autistic and I don't know how to support them without like sending them to ABA or something shitty like that. Like, what do I do with that? Or my kid is trans, but hasn't told me yet. I found out because X, Y, Z, like, how do I support them? And so to me, those things aren't mothering and they're not gendered. That's just like a kind, compassionate thing to do. And so I think like, I ask people to think about the impact that they have on others, right? And what they've done that is meaningful to other people. But I don't think we need to gender it. And I don't think we need to correlate it to parenting, right? Like this is what mutual aid looks like. This is what community care looks like. And when we come from a disability justice approach, right? Like we're all interconnected. We all buy in and we take care of each other and we center the most marginalized. And that to me is so much more important than the idea of connecting with some, again, like cishet white supremacist idea of like the mother as the Madonna whore I'm like I'd rather just do the work that needs to be done and connect with the people who need that and like don't box me into your like weird gendered stuff I'm so glad you said that because somebody said I don't even want to nurture that's okay that's okay many of you do not feel like nurturing I'm extremely nurturing um but that doesn't matter. If you're a nurturing person and not because you're mothering in some no, way. Right, right, exactly. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's this, I was reading this morning, uh, there was a book review uh, in the New Yorker, or the New York Times uh, by Gia Tolentino was doing a book review of somebody else's book. And uh, Gia was saying, she said, while she was uh, in the throes of like new motherhood, she said, maybe I eventually should write about caregiving, how I can only care for her because I'm being cared for, how we have to make of ourselves and our situations a soft place for others to land. And that really resonated with me and what we were gonna be talking about today. And I think, you know, Shana, I wanted to first apologize because I, I, I know I misgendered you earlier when I was speaking and I'm sorry about that. And I, um, you know, when you were talking about showing up for your trans and non-binary kids and that you, you work with, I think that this is something that we don't, 
we don't think about that. Like we don't, we as a society don't think about it enough. And like these kids that are coming up right now who are, you know, sort of like their autonomy, their bodily autonomy is being attacked daily and how difficult it is for them sort of walking, walking around in the world. I have a classmate who is non-binary and we've been dealing a lot with how they are, are gendered, misgendered all the time. The challenge that they're dealing with is sort of the way that um, who they're out to and who they feel comfortable being out to. And so how do, how do they navigate that? And how can we help them navigate that in the world? Because they're not even out to like their mom. And so like thinking about all of those things and the way that those get navigated, but like, I don't need to be mothering to show up for them. Right. And I also want to note that they're not out to their mom. Right. So let's that's talk about if, if we're saying that mothering is this, the best thing that you can do in correct. our society. Right. And these connections that you make to your kids are innate and you're supposed to love them regardless of who they are. Right. Because somehow yep. biology is this deep innate connection. Then how do you explain how many mothers have kicked their yep. trans and queer kids out of their homes? Correct. Or have said, I will tolerate this but not affirm you, right? Like all right. of these things. Right. And so to me, mothering a family of blood, a family of origin is not inherent. Like to me, it's not as important because I, and Marcia, this goes to you, right? Who do you choose? You're saying, I choose for you to be my sister, right? And like my sister and I have come around, but we have had some journeys. And like most of the people in my life, I am so much closer to than my family of origin because there isn't this assumption that we just love each other because we're biologically connected. It's because these are the people I choose to support and whether it's their kids or them or my students, like I am choosing where to put my energy and my love and my compassion rather than just assuming that it's supposed to innately grow when we see that that's not actually the case. Shanna, thank you for that. I'm going to jump into the questions because we have a question from Tess who says, what qualities make a chosen family? I'd like to build one. Any advice for Tess? Step one, find people you like. Um, but, like but, you. But, right, like you. you. <laughs> yes, yes. But I mean, I think, and I think this has changed a lot in context because there are people that were in my chosen family who because of the ways they responded to the pandemic are no longer, right? Because there are people who made choices that endanger and are currently making choices that endanger people like me, right? And so, and then there's people who I didn't expect to show up for me like family who did, right? Like my colleague who, when my partner has had COVID twice, they work for Starbucks, right? It's considered, uh, you know, urgent, what is it? Uh, you know, frontline service that cannot be stopped. They've gotten COVID twice. And my, I had a co colleague who I barely talked to, who showed up with groceries, who showed up with dinner, who showed up with all of these things. And so like chosen family, then I said to her, I said, like, I appreciate you. And I'm, I'm glad to be in community with you. Like you are showing up for me in a way that some of my family hasn't. And so when I, what I invite you to think about, um, and this is maybe a little too out there, but I'm kind of an out there person, right, is like we tend to save the idea of I love you and I care about you for people that we're either biologically connected to or romantically involved with. But that that is, again, also made up just like all of this. And so when you find people who show up for you or you show up for people in that way, make them your family. You can start creating words like like sister friends or like, you know, brother from another mother or how, you know, people have all sorts of language. I just start telling people I love you at the end of a text conversation or when they drop off groceries and I'm like, we are struggling right now and you showed up in this beautiful way. Like, thank you and I love you. And that, right, that's how, it doesn't have to be a family where you like create, I mean, you could create your own family tree and family shield if you wanted to, but it doesn't need to be as formal as we'd like our families of origin to be. It can be as simple as like, I showed up for you in this way, or you showed up for me in this way. And I'm telling you, I appreciate you. And I value you being part of my life, my community, my family, however, you know, and so you might have some people that you consider, you know, like your, your, 
nuclear family of choice and then some people who are on the outskirts or you might just say like hey this is my family and as you know marshall's like oh and this person and also this person right so it, it can be a couple of people that you start to like make a pod of family with or it can just be like what is in your your orbit and who's there and it can shift over time I love the idea of making a family tree of your chosen family and a love that. family crest. I, it's so marvelous. It's lovely. Oh God, my my branch won't be hanging, wilting, falling off. I'd have, I've had so many branches underneath that. Thank you. That is such a tool. And how many seeds have you planted? Right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. That's a great I, idea. I really love that, Shanna. And I think like, I think you also can have multiple sort of families, like parts of families, you know, I mean, I, I am very close to my nuclear family, my original one, except for my brother, but, you know, it's where, you know, so we have parts of Steve's, my husband's family that we are, you know, we are contact with and close to kind of, but I also have like my best friends who I am, you know, but not even like my even my best friends who I have, like, I consider family don't all know each other because they're from different parts of my life. And so they right. haven't all always met each other. And I have like new, you know, people from school and like, you can, it's okay to have different groups of them that you rely on in different ways too. I don't think they all have to be like one big circle. It can be different things and that's okay. And, it, and it's also going to change over time throughout your life. And I think Shanna made a really good point with you will people will, during times of crisis, people will not show up. And then different people you don't expect will, will show up in ways that you were like, oh my God, I had no idea that person would be there for me. Um, you know, and everything changes as you age and get older. And, um, you know, my girlfriends and I already have our whole golden girls, you know, Florida. Well, maybe not Florida, but some Island somewhere. It's not going to be Florida, <laughs> maybe Hawaii somewhere our retirement plan. I want to give a shout out to some folks who are in the film <clears throat> and those of you who have seen the film have met Pat and Margaret who founded a LGBTQ friendly uh, and allies um, co-housing community for seniors. Um, they're, they're of a generation where many of them did not have children and um, Pat and Margaret who are a couple of really like envisioned this thing and manifested it uh, as a co-housing community. Um, it's really lovely. They also said that they had thought about getting a big house and living together. Uh, and that really turned out to be a bad, bad idea. So uh, I think the co-housing thing with the people having their own homes and a little community center, um, it's a great place. So. I think co-housing is part of that, part of that future. Um, Shanna, there's a question here, which is, um, you've, you've really mostly answered it, I have to say, but I'm gonna read it from someone anonymous. Um, As an immunocompromised person in the pandemic, I would love to hear, especially from Shanna, the impact of disability, health issues in creating our chosen family and how this can go against the nuclear family narrative. Uh, any quick uh, response to that? Yeah, I mean, I just think about like for a long time moving here, it was hard to get a new neurologist. And so I had to drive 45 minutes to an hour to go get my migraine shots, which I can't drive back from, right? You know, you get like 20 something shots in your face and head and need to decompress. And I put on Facebook one day, I was like, my partner can't take me. Like, is anybody available? And someone I had talked to maybe once or twice when I first moved here was like, yeah, I'd be happy to do that and did it right and like drove me and we got to know each other and it and showed up for me in a way that like like I don't remember the last time my mother or sister ever drove me to a doctor's appointment right um after I've had I think 12 or 13 surgeries at this point in my life Leo having top surgery even with Leo and Allie we've talked now especially with the um with what's happening with Roe about both of them getting hysterectomies I don't have a uterus but they both do um and neither of them has interest in carrying a child, um, a lot of beards and babies, which is totally a thing and lots of trans mask folks do it, but they have no interest in it. Um, 
and our community has said, you know, we will show up for you in these ways, right? Like whether it's a meal train, whether it's somebody going to physical therapy with me, whether it's um, the way that a lot of communities showed up, my fam, like my chosen family showed up at the beginning of the pandemic is we all got onto a group thread and said, um, who has alcohol swabs? Cause a lot of us take shots regularly and we couldn't find rubbing alcohol anywhere because there was a run on making your own hand sanitizer. There was a run on gloves. Uh, sharing PA is personal attendance. So those of us that were practicing very intense um, COVID protocols, you know, sharing those people that could come support us. And instead of them being people we hired from the outside, we pooled our money and have people locally that we know friends of ours, we can pay them to do the personal care work um, because then we keep it in the family. And so I think there's a lot of ways that when we talk about disability, um, like Leo is great, in lots of ways, he hates hospitals and he hates medical stuff. Allie, my other partner, is fine with those kind of things, right? And is really good as a support. And so, um, you know, you don't have to be non-monogamous, although that is a bonus. If you are disabled, you get extra people to support the caretaking so nobody burns out. But using your chosen family and saying, you know, like, you know, Michelle, you talked about buying a house for your parents, but like, what would it look like to create a, a a disabled chronically ill coast housing community where people care for each other a little queer commune um but it doesn't have to be a physical space it can also be like a group chat or a facebook group where people are like who needs what this week right and how do we take care of our family? you need some child care you need some uh, you know a travel to a doctor's appointment you need a massage like how do we make this all happen um but yeah, it's complicated when I've only seen like 10 people total in the past two years, the people that I actually see are ones that like I trust to, to take care of me and to be safe around me. Whereas there's lots of people I thought I would have trusted before that I don't anymore. There's another question here I wanna um, throw to Marsha um, and then uh, Michelle and Shanna, please jump in if you have thoughts. Do you consider your family to change and morph as you age? And does it happen in any particular way? I just thought about how older adults tend to have less family over time due to aging and a loss of loved ones. We know that social connection is key to be able to age well. And that's from Heidi. Thank you, Heidi. You know, all during your life, people come in and out of your life for various reasons. Uh, sometimes they choose it. Sometimes death chooses it. Sometimes you choose it because you have too much respect for yourself to be involved with toxic energy. And that's been difficult for me, you know, because I have that in my family. But I've learned to just let go of those people because if they don't respect me, why am I grieving? What is the loss? Uh, so I let them go. So I think this happens to everybody as they get older. Uh, it could happen in your 20s and your 30s. It doesn't matter. But the people who stay are unconditionally loving and you know it, you feel it, they've proven it. So they remain a part of your life forever. Does that answer that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Michelle, any thoughts? Yeah, I would say, um, I liked Marcia's point about you have too much respect for yourself. I would say that, um, you know, in the last number of years, I've had two relationships and um, one with my brother and, um, one with a friend that I had had for, a, a long time. I mean, it was the longest friendship I'd really had ever had. Um, and both of them were really around my, uh, <laughs> me becoming much more outspoken about reproductive justice and around, um, you know, gay and trans rights and, um, Black Lives Matter and my rejection of sort of like the Christian, I mean, I've always been an atheist, but becoming much more outspoken in my like support of uh, social justice issues, which I've always been, but I think just becoming much more outspoken in that after I turned 40 um, and deciding that like, this is where I was gonna just, how I was gonna live my life and people having a problem with that. Um, and I was like, you know, this is who I've always been. I've just kind of hidden it from you. I think really like once social media really sort of took off and I started using that as a way to like be 
to share my share who I really was and not hide. So then those parts that I had been able to hide from them previously were like less hidden um, that they were like, oh, and I was like, I, this is who I've always been. I just wasn't, it was easier to hide it from you because I wasn't like in this front facing platform all the time. Um, and I think, you know, it, it was really hurtful to me because I'm like, well, you've always known this about me. Maybe you just didn't see it because you didn't want to. And it wasn't in your face all the time because we did social media wasn't a thing. Um, but I think, you know, what it did was that then it allowed me to find other people who really were my community who really understood me and that was also a gift right because those people fell away but then i found other people who were like oh who you are is actually awesome and it invited all these other people into my life and that was great um so yeah i think you know it does change over time but in a lot of ways, it's good because it reveals who actually should be in your life, who matters, who, who wants to know who you really are and what's important to you and who shares your values. And if your values are important to you, um, then you want people alongside you who uphold those values as well. I think when you, when you, when you lose that friendship that you felt was so important to you, or that brother who was a part of your life, you have to go through the stages of grief, yes. the actual stages, which is the death of a relationship yep. until you reach for acceptance. I know it. I've faced it. I've suffered it. But when you get to that acceptance, it's so much more easier to just let that person go. Mm -hmm. That happened when I was the uh, keynote at the Nut Mom convention when I was speaking in front of a sea of infertile people plus child free by choice. And I realized when half the room left after I spoke that some people weren't ready for me. Yeah. And it wasn't for Jody Day saying to me, they're just not at acceptance, Marsha. It's not you. I was like, oh God. Yeah. It's not easy. No, I mean I'm I'm going through that a little bit right now. My my best friend from high school who has two kids, one, one during the pandemic I haven't met yet, the other one who I love, I just sent Redwall books, you know, her direction. Um, but Allie and I are having a, a commitment ceremony, a wedding of sort next month. And uh, originally, okay. thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited. Um, I had plans for her to be my, you know, one of my, my people, my wing people, my, you know, whatever they are. And uh, she, she told me in February, she's not coming because it's too close to her kids birthdays. And like, I had to go through like a grief process of like, your kids are seven and two, like, like also it's one weekend, like deal with the birthday stuff. Right. Like to me, my brain was like, okay, but like, I don't know. I haven't raised kids. I don't know what that looks like and how much of that is there. And I, I talked to my therapist, right. I was like, how do I navigate this? This feels like betrayal, right? You know, and, and she and I have since had a great conversation and, and we're in a good place, right? But like, it never occurred to me that this relationship that I've had for, you know, over two decades at this point would experience this, this chasm around something like this, right? Um, you know, you asked about, about aging. Um, and I think at some point you said you were going to ask about, you know, who takes care of us when we're old. Um, and I, I loved he hearing your stuff, Michelle, I'm not nurturing in that way to my, my, my sister and mom are super codependent. So they live like five minutes from each other in Virginia. I visit like once every two years because it's very expensive to get to this tiny little town. Um, but I did fly out when she needed to have surgery because I'm really good at navigating healthcare systems, right? So like my mom's doing her own thing. We've had talks about like where she's going next. I have no interest in moving down there or caretaking in that way. Um, you know, and so people sometimes ask like, well, what is your plan when you get older? And I have a like 65, I will turn 65 in 2050. Um, and with climate change, I'm done. Like I, you know, this is, this is my choice. And like, I've talked to my therapist about, it. I was like, this is, you know, I'm like, it's kind of a suicide plan, but like, she's like, I'm there with you. Right. <laughs> like our, our planet needs less people on it. Um, I'm already in so much pain on the daily. I'm so exhausted and I've done such amazing things, right? Like I've lived, I'm on my third career at this point. I love the life I've lived. 
And so when I hit 65, I'm like, let's have a party and, and that will be my plan. And that's not everybody's plan. Right. And I, and I want to be clear like that. I don't think disabled people should be killing themselves or doing assisted suicide because of like ableism in our society. But I also think about like our, our two biggest reservoirs in the U S are almost empty. Right. Like we're finding dead people in barrels from the seventies is like, that's how, how drained these reservoirs are and forest fires and all of that. And so, you know, this idea that a children are supposed to care for their parents, like that's a pretty shitty contract to put babies into, right? Like I'm birthing you so that you will take care of me. Um, and I also, you know, this idea that, that death is something to be feared and we're supposed to prolong every life as long as possible. You know, I think about this with our animals, you know, my cat's 18 and we're navigating that and like, what, what is a quality of life for him? Um, you know, so I'm like, I don't want anybody to feel like they have to take care of me. I have a plan and I know what it looks like. And sure, it might change. And like we get a queer commune and that's where we all end up. But I, I really struggle with the idea that our family is inherently like I never signed a contract to take care of my mother. Right. Like that's a social contract we've been given, but it's not something that like I consented to. And so this idea that you're supposed to just have kids or just build these families of choice solely for the purpose of caretaking for you when you age um, feels like a lot of expectations and a lot to put on someone who didn't get to consent into that. I agree. I think no matter what, everybody should have a decent, good financial advisor, somebody they really feel knows what they're doing. I have had both the good ones and the bad ones. Um, very important from an early age to have a plan for at least money. That's a well, lot. of you to assume that millennials have access to right. money. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, I think, you know, this also comes back to bodily autonomy because not every state has medical aid in dying. Right. And in America, we don't have we have very strict criteria around why you're allowed to have medical aid in dying, right? So like in Canada now, in, um, in the Netherlands, that you can, um, like intractable mental illness is a reason for medical aid in dying. We don't but have that. I want to be clear is also its own issue because 25% of disabled people in Canada who selected interest in medical aid and dying said it was because they felt like they were a burden to others, right? right? And we live in such an ableist system that I don't know if somebody can completely consent to that if the only idea right. is I don't wanna be an issue to others when maybe if we made our system more inclusive and supporting of disabled and chronically ill and mentally ill folks, yes. right? Then they wouldn't want to, right? Yeah, so it's right. talk about bioethics, right? Like so many right. complex conversations. But I think like this is being able to choose how and when you leave this plane, this mortal coil is also a conversation. And, you know, one of the things that Steve talks about is he's like, it doesn't matter that I don't have kids because I can pay someone to take care of me, but we are in the financial position to do that a lot of people are not and are not going to be. So many people are not going to be in this world. Um, and so like that is another, there's a whole justice issue around that. So I think like there are all these things, it's fine to say, it's, it's not appropriate to say that like, first of all, even if you have kids, that doesn't guarantee that they're gonna take care of you because they could be an asshole and just like. Or they, they may not have the resources. Or, right. or geographically would okay. not be able to. There's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why <laughs> birthing your elder care doesn't actually right. seem birthing like your it. elder care. I love that Teresa. Yeah. Birthing your elder care. I mean, so I think like it's just not it's not an answer to anything. And also, like, there are other countries that have systems set up to take care of the elderly. That is another thing we don't do here because we view the elderly as disposable, despite the fact that we want to prolong your life as long as possible. And we will put you on a ventilator for 20 fucking years and not give a shit about it. This is such a joyous way to end this conversation. 
<laughs> no, thank you very much. We're over time. And, and I thank the, our attendees for, for hanging out with us. Uh, I think you're all, you've been great and you put in great things into the chat that we are gonna share with everybody. Right now, I wanna uh, ask our panelists for a final thought. One thought that people can take away uh, from this, and I want you to do it in one sentence. Is that possible? What do you think? Marsha, go. We're born into family, and sometimes it's not a good fit. All right. Uh, bodily autonomy is for everybody, um, and that means uh, women, trans and non-binary people, men, uh, children have bodily autonomy, old folks have bodily autonomy, and what is happening right now affects all of us. That was a big sentence. That's, that's good. Good use of commas. Michelle. Academic and training. Um, I would just say family is what you make of it and how you define it, and there is no one way to be a family. Thank you very much. I really want to thank you all. Um, I said this in last night at Friday night's panel as well. I really, really enjoyed uh, working with you three on the film, every moment of it. And I really enjoyed having you on this panel. And I really want to thank you for all of the collaboration you've done to bring this film into the world and to continue the conversation once it was out. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Um, Teresa, am I correct that the photo that you use is the one taken in my living room? Yes, yes. Thank you, Michelle, for taking one of my um, like official headshots in your living room. This is the best way to do headshots. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Thank you so much for having <laughs> us. This is always a joy to, to connect in these ways. And I hope everybody takes care and stays safe during these ongoing times. Yeah. And before you all leave us, I have a, a few important things to tell you. I want to thank Marge and Melinda, who have been our production crew. Thank you very much. And um, I want to plug our final filmmaker conversation, which is between me and my mother, Miriam Schechter. And if you have seen the film, you know why I want to do this with my mother. She has become the breakout star of this <laughs> film. She is a really wonderful and fascinating person. And we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation Saturday, May 14th, that's this coming Saturday, to kind of close out the run of this film. And uh, I, I'd love for you all to join us and, and be there and chat with us. And I think it's gonna be really great. Um, this conversation, like all three conversations are going to be recorded and posted. And if you check in with the, the page where you bought your ticket and are watching the film, we have a running, uh, thing there with links to the recordings and um, get your get your tickets if you haven't yet. I really don't want you to miss this film. It's it's great if I do say so myself. Yes. Um, and uh, if anyone out there uh, wants the film for their school, their nonprofit, their conference, their company, uh, please contact me. Um, just go to myselfishlife.com. That's our website for the film, myselfishlife.com, or come say hey, or check out everything else that's on the site. So thank you again. I'm Teresa Schechter. I'm the director of My So-Called Selfish Life, and um, really appreciate you all being here. Thanks.